your blood uh, is eternal life. Uh, you got to repent of all your sin. In the day where people are so opinionated and they feel that their opinions are worth their weight in gold. And of course, if you do not accept their opinion, uh, then something's wrong with you as far as they're concerned because uh, they feel that their opinion um, is worth its weight in gold. Well, everybody has an opinion about something, is that right? But what we need to realize is that whenever the word of God has spoken on a subject, it doesn't matter what anybody's opinion is. The only thing that is important is what did God say? And that's the only important, that's the only thing that's going to stand. Um, our opinions, if they contradict the word of God, they don't mean anything. They might mean something to me, but as far as God's concerned, they mean nothing. Because the only thing that is forever settled in heaven is the word of God. David said, O oh, oh Lord, forever thy word is settled in heaven. And the word of God, the Bible says, the word of God endureth forever. It shall never pass what? Away. And the reason why the word of God will endure forever because uh, God will endure forever. And so my opinions, what I have to say, is not going to endure forever. The only thing that's going to outlast uh, time and go into eternity and still exist is the word of God or what God has said. And so many people have their opinions now. The young people of the day, um, you know, they have different classes of people that have, have different labels on them. They have millennials. They say about millennials that millennials know a lot, but they understand very little. <laughs> now, I'm not saying this is what they say. And they say the reason why millennials know a lot is because they understand the latest technological advancements, um, the computers and, and all these type of things. But when it comes to them understanding simple, basic, fun, uh, fundamental, foundational truths, they have difficulty with that. Um, in our society, the times that we're living, on the, living in today is that people are encouraged to challenge everything. They are uh, inspired to question everything. And we're going to get to that a little later on in the Bible class. We're going to show you that part of that attitude is of the devil. Because now things that we know that are true and have been true and have been proven that they are true Many people today even want to challenge that. Now, I don't know if you heard about the little boy that got into the gorilla, um, that went to the zoo, and he uh, got himself in the, uh, what is that? Um, he got himself in the what? The habitat of the gorilla at the zoo. And, of course, dragging the little boy around, I think the three-year-old. And, of course, the zookeepers, uh, feared that the gorilla would kill the little boy, so they shot and killed the gorilla. Now there are people that are having the, of the opinions that it was wrong to kill the gorilla. And even some that are saying, well, why do we have a zoo anyway? It's wrong to capture these animals and to cage them uh, and all this other type of stuff. So now they're even challenging the idea of even having a zoo. Now we've had zoos for how long? Who knows? Did we say amen? You know, uh, but it is just a reflection of the spirit that we're dealing with today. Now they're talking about criticizing having a zoo. When we've had zoos as long as we can remember. There were no problems with them then. Why is there problems with them now? That's because of the type of spirit that we're dealing with today. Well, um, that's not a subject. We'll get to that because we're going to deal with the spirit of the Antichrist after we get done with this. But we want to look at and see what the Bible has to say concerning marriage and divorce. Now, we're just scratching the surface tonight because if I was to teach this subject in its entirety, it would probably take at least six Bible classes to go through it in detail. But we're just going to hit the high points 
and show you some things. Now, first of all, let's go to Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 4. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 4 and verse number 4. And as our custom, we're going to ask everyone to read together out loud uh, in unison as we read these scriptures um, so that you won't be able to say that Pastor Johnson said it or Brother Nicholas said it or Sister Rhoda said it. If you read it out loud for yourself, you have to say that who said it? The Word of God said it. Is that right? Can we say amen? All right, so Matthew chapter 4, verse number 4. And of course, if you read the Word of God out loud for yourself, It'll make an impression on you than it would if you just sat and let somebody read it to you. It'll be in your mouth. So let's put the word of God in our mouths. Verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man shall not live. Now this is a quotation uh, taken from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, I think it's Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Moses quoted this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of where? The mouth of God. In Deuteronomy, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. So what we want from this scripture is to show you that every word of God is important. Every word of God. That we are to live by every word of God. Now many people like to say, well I don't think God is that technical. That we have to go by every word. Well if you remember Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle of the law shall fail until all be fulfilled. And as we've said before, if you look in your Bible and find a period or the dot of an I, that's a jot. If you look in there again and find the cross of a T, that's a tittle. So what was Jesus saying was that the word of God is of such great importance that you cannot miss a dot of an I or a period or a cross of a T. All of it is important. And so we are to live by every word not just portions of the Bible that we agree with and other portions of the Bible that we don't agree with. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that if you don't agree with the word of God, your disagreement is not with me, it's with who? God, you disagree with God. And one man, the first man that disagreed with God was Cain. And we know how he wound up. Can we say amen? He wound up being cut off from God. Nobody's going to God's heaven that is in conflict with God. That is impossible. No more than you allow anybody to live in your house that is in conflict with who? With you. If you got rules in your house that says, look, I don't want folk coming in my house all during the night. Uh, you need to be in by 11 o'clock. And here they come strolling in at 4. And then they come in. Then you question them. Then they want to argue with you. What's going to happen? You going to renew their lease? No. <laughs> Can we say amen? No. So... Uh, and, and, and see, that's the type of attitude people have today. You see, the arrogance and pride of man today is just off the charts. Just off the charts. To the point to where they feel that they can pick and choose certain portions of the Bible as long as they don't invade their lives. That they're willing. And if you give them the word and that word is judging them as they're receiving it and they don't like it, well, then that's your opinion. Well, you can call it whatever you want to call it. In the end, you're going to see that it is the word of who? Word of God. Can we say amen? Because all of us are going to have to face God at some point. We had nothing to do with getting here. And just as much as that we had nothing to do with as to how we came into this world. As sure as that was, we will face God one day. So, we are to live by every word, not just a paragraph, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, one thing about the Holy Bible, as I made a note of it on Sunday, the Bible has a little over 40 writers, 40 authors that wrote the book over a period of 3,600 years. 
And many of these individuals did not even know each other. And out of all of the 66 pieces of literature that we have in our Bible, which, consider, which is our Bible, none of it contradicts each other. Now, there have been some that says the Bible was contradictory, and I have taken up that challenge with many individuals that said there were contradictions in the Bible. And I said, whoa, show me. And come to find out the contradiction was not in the Bible. The contradiction was in their mind because there is no contradiction in God. He is perfect. Can we say amen? You know, all right. So we want to establish the fact that every word, now there's over 5 million words in the Bible. There's 1,189 chapters, 37,173 verses, and there are over 5 million um, words in the Bible. And all of it is important. Every word that proceedeth out of what? Mouth of God. I think it's five, over 5 million letters. I think it's something like uh, 400,000 words, something like that. I'm going to have to look that up and see. I used to have all that stuff uh, written down. Praise the Lord. But anyway, every word. Can we say amen? Every word. And I do know it's 37,173 verses. Every word of God. We have to live by every word. Now, a lot of people like to say what sin is and what sin is not. And what we need to realize, like the late Bishop Paddock used to say, sin is not what you say it is. It's not what I say it is. It's what God says it is. That's what sin is. Whatever God says sin is, that is sin. Now, there are some people that say nobody can live above sin. One preacher said, he was told, the only way that you're going to live above sin is if somebody is a sinner that lives downstairs and you live upstairs. There's no truth to that whatsoever. Um, and I was talking to a, a minister that said nobody can live above sin. Nobody can live free from sin. I said, well, that's not true. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, therefore being made free from sin. He said, do you violate the speed limit? I said, probably every chance I get. He said, well, then you sin because the Bible says obey the laws of the land. I said, there is no scripture. And so obey the laws of the land. No scripture in the Bible. It says in the 11th chapter of Romans, I think it is, uh, or the 16th chapter of Romans, somewhere around there, be subject to the higher powers. That doesn't mean obey all the laws of the land. It didn't say that. So he said, well, if the speed limit says 35 and you do 45, you sin. I said, no, you haven't sinned. You violated the speed limit. You violated a civil law. That's not even violation of a criminal law. That's violation of a civil law. I said, and I never read in the Bible where God says thou shalt not go 10 miles over the speed limit. So people like to say what sin is and what sin is not. But the Bible tells us what sin is. So let's go to 1 John, 1st Epistle of John, chapter 3 and verse number 4. 1st Epistle of John chapter 3 and let's see what the Bible says sin is. First epistle of John chapter 3 verse number 4 all right let me say amen what the Bible says sin is. First epistle of John chapter 3 verse number 4 all right we have it. Let's read. Whoso committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, sin is the violation or the breaking of God's law. Any of God's law that any of his children break, it is a what? Sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the breaking of God's law. God says that if we violate any of his laws, it is a what? Sin. It doesn't matter who does it. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what status they have in the church. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter if they're a bishop or a pastor. Sin is the transgression of the law. And what law is that? The law of God. Can we say amen? So any violation, any time we break or violate any of the word of God, 
the Bible says it is a sin because sin is the transgression of the law of who? God. Can we say amen? Now let us go to Matthew chapter 5. We have to show you all this before we get into the marriage and divorce thing. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 19. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 19. All right. Matthew 5 and 19. All right. If we have it, let's read. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and, number two, shall teach men so or teach someone to break them, let's read, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if I'm considered the least in the kingdom of heaven, what chance do I have to make it with God if I'm the least? Well, let's read on. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called what? Great where? In the kingdom of heaven. So if I'm going to be successful with God, I'm going to have to be great. And being great in God means to do his commandments and to teach others to do likewise. If I am teaching folk to violate the word of God, or if I violate the commandments, the least of the commandments, then God considered me the least in the kingdom of heaven. And this is in the church. So if we are violating the law of God, the least of God's law in the church, then we are least. And what chance will I have making the rapture? What chance will I have making the rapture if I violate or do not obey any of the commandments of God. If I don't do his commandments, then I'm transgressing the what? Law of God. And then I am what? What is my spiritual condition? In sin. Well, I don't feel like I am. It ain't based on your feelings. It's based on what God said. Can we say amen? So if I teach men, I've just added to my sin. That's all. Added to my judgment. If I don't do it, and I teach others not to do it, sin is the breaking of God's law, and I'm considered least in the kingdom of heaven as far as God's concerned. Now, I might think a whole lot of myself, but God say I'm what? Least. You see, today people feel that uh, how they feel about themselves and how they look at themselves is that's it. Oh, no, that's not it. It's not about how we feel about ourselves. It's what about what God's saying about us. Does that make sense? Because he's the one that's going to decide whether I measured up to his standards or not. He's the one that's going to decide whether or not I have pleased him or not, or did I just please myself? Now, you can please yourself if you want to. You can do whatever you want to do. Like the songwriter said, this your thing. Do what you want. But then God's going to do what he wants to do with you in the end. Can we say amen? You see, what it all comes around. You know, it all comes back around because we all going to have to face God. So, um, and this is pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's pretty black and white, right? Or red and white, if you're reading the words of Jesus. So, um, sin is the breaking of God's law. If I do not obey God's commandments, I am least in the kingdom of heaven. If I do not obey his commandments, I'm sinning. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. And he's not talking about natural death. He's talking about spiritual death. Eternal banishment from God in the lake of fire. All right. Let's look at another scripture. Matthew 18, verse number 6. Matthew 18. I know some folk ain't going to like this, but it don't matter what they like. I didn't write the Bible. I'm just telling you what's in it. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I didn't write the book. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 6. Now let's go a little further now. All right. If we have it, Matthew chapter 18, verse number 6. Let's read. But whoso shall offend one of these 
little ones. Now, the word offend doesn't mean that you hurt their feelings. It means you cause them to sin. That's what offend in this verse means. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, one of his children, which believe in me, it were what? Better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were what? Drowned where? In the sea. Are we reading the same scripture? That's pretty, that's pretty vivid, isn't it? God's saying you better off committing suicide than causing one of my children to sin. That's what he's saying. Remember when Jesus was at about to partake of the Lord's Supper. And he said to his disciples, he just made a blanket statement. Verily, verily, I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. And Jesus said, woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And I was listening to the late Bishop Hancock. I used to have that tape, late Bishop Hancock. Uh, his sermon was, what have you done to Jesus? Because when he was on the cross being crucified, darkness was over the land. Uh, you know, there, there was a whole lot of shaking, the rocks rent, and all of the things, the elements of the earth and the weather began to be affected because somebody had did something to Jesus. And he talked about the fact Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Because of the aftermath of the judgment of God that was to come upon that person for what they did, because the punishment was, is to be so severe for what that person had done, it had been better if they had never walked the face of the earth. And you know what? Judas is not the only one that is betraying Christ. You got folk betraying Jesus today. Some that have been baptized in his name and filled with his spirit. Folk that have gotten saved and backslid. You know what they've done? All they did was betray Christ. And what's the message for them? Woe unto that saint by who the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that person if they had not been born. That's why I don't fool with backsliders. I don't mess with them. Because it had been better, well, even Peter said in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, it had been better if one had not known the truth than to know it and to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Then he says, it has happened unto them like the proverb, the dog has returned back to his vomit. That's all a backslider does. They just went back to the vomit that God brought them out of. Can we say amen? Bishop, uh, the late Bishop Bonner used to say, why do people backslide? To go right back into the mess God brought them out of. They go right back. And the devil's always trying to bring you back. Why do you think the devil's always trying to bring your past up to you? Always trying to bring up your past, those past feelings. That one that you ain't seen in 10 years. I was just thinking about you. Oh, I know you was. I know you was, devil. You <laughs> say, man? And, 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 and I just, I just, how you doing? Now, the devil know how you doing. Trying to bring the walking dead. Can we say, man? The zombies back, and they look so ugly. You like, man, I didn't know he looked. I, what was I looking? What was I thinking back then when I was unsaved? Look at him. He looks like Dracula and the werewolf mixed in together. Oh yeah, that's what the devil. He's just trying to take us back to the past. Some things it ain't good to look back on. Is that right? Oh, do you remember? No, I try not to remember. <laughs> I try not to remember. Well. That's what Jesus said here now. Now, well, uh, where are we? Yeah, it's been better. The millstone tied about his neck. All right, now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go here. So, if I'm saved, K 
Can I marry somebody not saved? Let's see what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. And of course, it deals with uh, marriage uh, in, in, this, in this chapter. Because you have a whole lot of folk in the church that are marrying people that are outside of the church. And let's see what the Bible says. And they feel that it's all right. Well, let's see what the scripture says. Verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband, what? Liveth. So if you have a couple that's married, they are bound. They are in the marriage covenant. And God said, what God had joined together, let no man do what? Put a son. And what does God join together? Husband and wife. Some people say man and woman. No, husband and wife. What God had joined together, let not a man put asunder. So the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband, what? Liveth. She's bound. All right? If she goes out and divorces him, Jesus said in Matthew 5, whosoever divorce except for fornication causes her to commit adultery. So the only grounds in the church for a couple to divorce is fornication. That's what Jesus said. Now, if you have a problem with that, you got a problem with Jesus. Can we say amen? We'll read that. Because you have saints in the church that are divorcing and marrying whoever they want to marry. A preacher called me up the other day. What if a couple, there's a couple that decided that they are going to sever their marriage relationship. Neither one of them has committed fornication. Neither one of them have been unfaithful. They both decided to sever their marriage relationship and go out and marry somebody else. What is their status? They're adulterers. That's all they are. Because Jesus said, except for what? For what? Fornication. And it don't matter what people think. That's what Jesus said. Is that right? And if they divorce without the right cause, which is fornication, whosoever shall break one of these laws is considered the what? Least. Where? Kingdom of heaven. Because sin is the transgression of what? The law. So if I get up and divorce my wife and did not have a cause, I'm violating the law of God. I am in what? That's what the Bible says. I'm in sin. Well, that's your opinion. No, this is God's opinion. And it's something that's going to stand for how long? See, my opinion might not stand till next week. But the word of the Lord is forever settled where? And it don't make no difference who agree with it or not. It don't make no difference who like it or not. What if some would not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God in effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true. And every man what? A liar. I had a tape of Bishop David L. Ellis preaching. And he preached from that text. And his subject was, so what? You don't believe it? So what? He threw down too. I used to have that tape. But anyway, uh, let's read on here. But if her husband be what? Dead, she is at what? Liberty to be married to whom she will. What? Only in the Lord. Now, if I marry outside of the Lord, I have violated the commandment of God. I have broken the law of God. Sin is the violation of God's law. I am in what? Sin, according to the Bible, as far as God's concerned. Now, you might not feel like you are. <laughs> not you. But there might be some out there listening that, uh, well, I don't feel, it don't matter how you feel. It's what the Bible says. You know, so you can only marry if you are saved, you can only marry somebody that is saved. Now, what if a saved person marries somebody that is not saved? Well, they have entered into a marriage relationship that is sinful. And the only way you, they can get out of that relationship or get out of that sin is that they have to sever the relationship. And there's three ways that it can be done. Because once a saint marries an unsaved, they have put themselves out of the body of Christ. They're backslidden. Well, because if the Bible says you marry only in the Lord and you married outside of the Lord, and if sin is the breaking of God's law, then that person committed a what? A sin. Now, the 
problem that we have today is because there's not so much word of God being taught, taught. Many of the pastors are not teaching the subject of marriage and divorce. And a lot of people are just doing whatever they want to do. And so some folk don't know any better. And they go out, they divorce, they marry, they divorce, they marry, because many of them don't know, don't know any better. Because the pastors are not telling them what the Bible says. And God's going to get those pastors too. They're going to be held accountable for that. Can we say amen? But there are those that know better. And you have a whole lot of folk in the church that are in messed up marital relationships because they started it off violating the word of God. Now, let's go to um, Leviticus chapter 22. I gave you a New Testament scripture. Let me give you an Old Testament scripture. Leviticus chapter 22. Well, you talking about my mama. I ain't talking about your mama. I'm telling you what the Bible said. Get your mama. Could we say amen? Your mama better get, you better get right. Save yourself from this untoward what? I'm feeling good. See, when you do God's will, you can feel good. Can we say amen? You don't do God's will, and then you hear the word comes, you get mad. Quit your teeth. You start spitting and cussing and carrying on. What you spitting for? Wipe your spit and do what the Bible says do. Hallelujah. Leviticus chapter 22, verse number 12. Now look at this now. Because um, this is uh, really something. Now, Leviticus 22 and 12. Now this is why a person that marries somebody that is out of the church, it puts them out of the church. It makes puts them in the same status or condition of the person that they marry that is outside of the church. And here's your scripture. Let's read verse 12. If the priest's daughter, now who's our high priest? Who's our high priest? Jesus. Now that in those days, the priests were a type of Jesus Christ, the high priest. If the priest's daughter, let's read, also be married unto a what? Stranger. Mary is a stranger, somebody that's not of the tribe of Israel, a stranger. Let's read. She may not eat of an offering of the what? Holy things, because her status is in error. If she, um, well, let's read on verse 13. But if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child and is returned unto her father's house, as in her youth, she shall eat of her father's what? Meat. She can eat of the holy things because she is in good standing with God. Let's read. But there shall no stranger. What? Now, you know who that stranger is? That's the daughter that became a stranger because she married a what? Stranger. If the stranger can't eat and she marries a stranger and she can't eat, then what is her condition now as far as God's concerned? She is a what? Stranger. So when a person marries outside of the church, that puts them out of the church because they are now of the same status as the person that was not saved because when they marry, they too shall become what? One. Why, that's the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments in the Old Testament too, is that right? You go out there and kill somebody and see what's going to happen to you. <laughs> you know. So, and I shared this scripture in the Bible class previously. I got calls from all over the country. <laughs> what, is, what is that scripture saying? I said, I, we just told you in Bible class what it's saying. So, many people mess themselves up and they bind themselves because they will not follow the word of God. Now, if a saint marries a sinner, they have put themselves out with God. And there's only three ways that they can be freed to get themselves straightened out with God. It doesn't automatically straighten them out. It just frees them up so that they can be restored. Because if one violates the word of God, even in a marriage situation, they are in sin and you cannot stay in that marriage and not be in sin. 
Just like if I was to break in your house and steal your TV and then I get caught, I can't say I'm sorry and be in your good graces and still keep your what? TV. I got to give you what? Your TV back. So if I marry someone that is not saved, I put myself outside of God. And as long as I'm in that relationship, I am in violation of the word of God. And I am lost because how can you be saved in sin? And there's only three ways that the person can get free. We've already read one of them. If the individual that they married that was not saved gets saved, if that person gets saved, then that frees the sinful party to be able to get restored back to God and get rid of their sin. Or if the person that they married divorces them, that can free them. The third one is, is that if the person dies, because marriage is until what? Death to part, then that frees. And I know personally of a case where a sister married outside of the church and she realized she had did wrong and she wanted to be restored. She couldn't be restored because she was in a sinful condition. You can't be restored and continue to sin. And so she was told, according to the scripture, this is what you have to do. So she went back to the spouse, asked him to want to be saved. He did not want to be saved. Okay. Then uh, she asked him for a divorce. He wouldn't divorce. So she went back to the pastor and said, okay, well, we're just going to have to pray uh, for God to do something. And, of course, um, this individual uh, was working in a high-rise construction. And of course, the, I think it was a 100-story building. And the elevator went up so he can get down. The elevator came up, the doors opened, he stepped out, but there was no floor. And plunged all the way down to his death. The woman came back to church, got restored, walked with God until she died. Now, somebody says, well, God did that? Well, let me show you. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. I didn't have this in my notes, but uh, we'll read it. I have to find it. Isaiah. Um, let me see. It might be chapter 28. Let me see here. No, it's not 28. Let me see here, find the scripture uh, for you. Um, I know it's in Isaiah. All right, yeah, 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse number 3. When that happened, this scripture came to mind. Isaiah chapter 43. And verse number 4. All right, if we have it, let's read. God speaking concerning his people. Isaiah 43 and 4, let's read says, Thou was precious in my sight. Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people what? For thy God will do that. And he did that in that instance. Because she was precious in his sight, and really wanted to get herself right, and there was no other way for it to happen except for that one, God said, I will give men for thee and people for what? Thy life. 
Somebody said, well, I, I don't agree with that. Well, then you take that up with God because he the one said it. Can we say amen? I'm just telling you what he said. You know, and so that frees a person up to get restored because God, see, God takes the marriage relationship serious because according to Ephesians chapter number five, the marriage relationship is a symbol of God's relationship with the church. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself what? For it. That's why the first marriage on record was who? Y'all don't know? Adam and Eve, is that right? Not Adam and Steve, but Adam what? And Eve. Can we say amen? Adam didn't have four or five different wives. He only had who? Eve. All right. So God takes the marriage relationship serious. Now, let us go to um, Matthew 5, 31. Let's read that, and we're almost finished. We're going to go through the seventh chapter right quick. Um, Matthew chapter 5. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> but I'm just, I have to tell you what the Bible says. Can we say amen? I think that tends to make people matter when I say that. Uh, well, anyway, Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, 32. Now, Jesus here is instituting uh, how many times for I say unto you? I can't remember how many times he said it. I had it marked in my other Bible, but there are a number of times that he says, um, for I say unto you. I think it might be seven times. Let's look at verse 31. Let's read. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a what? Bill of divorce, writing of divorcement, verse 32. But I, Sandy, in other words, this is a law for the church age now. In the verse 31, that was a law before. Now he's instituting something else. He is amending the marriage law. Verse 32, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving or accept for the cause of fornication, causeth her to what? Commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced does what? Because they divorce without rightful cause, fornication. Not only her, but if him. I know some preachers that divorce their wives without a cause and still out preaching. They ain't got no anointing, <laughs> what they preaching. Some of my friends of mine. I don't associate with them, but, you know, I, they wouldn't marry to me. I ain't got no problem with them as a person, but they can't, they'll never preach here, you know, um, because if you violate, sin is the breaking of whose law? God's law. See, you just can't just associate with just anybody. We should have learned that when we were kids. Is that right? I don't want you hanging around with fast Fanny. She too fast. <laughs> Somebody said, who's Fast Fanny? She was on Sanford and Son, if you don't remember. <laughs> but yeah, we teach our children. We were taught we couldn't hang around with certain people. You know? So even in the church, you just can't hang around with just anybody. Well, he's my best friend, and he's a transvestite. I thought Jesus was your best friend. <laughs> Can we say amen? <laughs> well, you know, he's gay, and, and uh, unless, unless you're talking about he's happy, and I ain't got no problem with it. You know? Well, he's my best friend. I thought Jesus was. Because you know, and I'm going to say this, I know it's controversial, but in, in some cases it's true, that black women seem to get along with gay guys pretty good from what I've seen. And, you know, and it gets pretty bad if you have a gay friend and you talk to him and then all of a sudden you say, girl, I mean... I remember I was on, when I was working at the prison, uh, there was this one girl, she used to come to work and her hair used to be looking all kind of, all kind of ways. I said, who do your hair? She said, my barber, you ought to come and see him. And so she gave me this card. And in this card, she was dressed as uh, an angel with black wings. And her female friend was dressed as an angel with white wings. And it was this six foot six, gay as all outdoors guy in the middle 
And she just said, he'll do a real good job on your head, cutting your hair. I said, oh, I got afraid. <laughs> I am not letting nobody like that mess with me. Get me in that chair, I might not be able to get out. <laughs> but I, don't, I don't know why that seems to be. You see it in the movies, don't you? Didn't you watch any of Tyler Perry's movies? If you watch one, you watch them all because they're all the same. When is he going to get some different themes? You know, black man struggling. He's divorced. He sees somebody else he wants. The ex-wife got custody of the kids. Blah, blah, all that. And of course, there's Medea. She's into everything. You know, when is he? But I guess it's working for him because he's making a lot of money. Then there's a show, and I actually tried to look at this show, and I couldn't watch it for no more than three minutes. You might know what it is. The haves and the have-nots. And every time I seem to turn it on, there's always the woman with the big forehead in the screen. She must be the star. One preacher was telling me about this program he just loved. I said, what show is that? The haves and the have-nots. I can't wait to get on and watch that. I said, what? <laughs> Sometimes what we watch is a reflection of what we... Can you say amen? Well, pastor, all I watch is Looney Tunes. You all right with me? I got some Looney Tunes at home recording. I love Looney Tunes now. I was watching... Uh, I remember when Alea was, was real little and we was watching um, Spongebob Squarepants and it was about to go off and they were doing their little thing and then just out of the blue one of the characters pulled his pants down and turned around and bent over then the show went off I was like and I remember Alea she said ugh I said, what does that have to do with the cartoon? You got to even watch your kids what, you know, what they watch. You just can't let them watch this anything. Is that right? SpongeBob SquarePants. Well, anyway, um, how did we get off into that? You ask me. You can say amen, but all I know is, is that we need to obey the word of God if we're going to go to heaven. Is that right? All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I want to show you something here. They had some questions about marriage and divorce asking the Apostle Paul. And so um, let's pick it up in verse number 10. Um, verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. I guess we ain't going to get to the Antichrist tonight. I wanted to talk about him a little bit. But anyway, verse number 10, let's read. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but what? The Lord, let not the wife, what? If the wife is married, let her not depart. Where? I'm leaving. The Bible says let her not what? Her husband. Verse 11. Verse 11. But and if, now we got a double negative there, but and if she depart, let her what? Remain unmarried or what? Be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband do what? Now you can't leave your husband and say, I'm on the dating scene again. No, you're not. Can we say amen? You are in violation of the word of God. That's what you are. Not you, but those that do it. So there are times. So what is this? This is separation. The Bible allows, if the married couple's having issues, they, the Bible allows a period of separation. But separation only for the purpose of reconciliation. Because I don't know any married couples that are separated, that can't get along down here, going to go to heaven. Does that make sense? If I can't get along with my wife down here, how are both of us going to heaven? Because if we can't get along down here, we're going to get along up there? No, because we won't be going up there. One of us ain't going to be going. Is that right? Because God's not going to have the mess in heaven that he has where? Down here. All right, we're almost finished. I guess we just have to deal with this tonight. Um, she has to 
remain um, unmarried or be what? Reconciled. And there have been instances where there had to be separation. But you separate in hopes of what? Reconciliation. Let's read verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. In other words, he doesn't have a New Testament scripture, an Old Testament scripture to cover this. But he, as an apostle, has the authority to write the New Testament commandments because that's what the apostle's job was. Lay the foundation of the New Testament church and to write the New Testament. So he's enacting an apostolic commandment now that is to be effective in the church. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Let's read. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not. Now if she is a wife that believeth not means that she's not saved. So this is a situation where two people come to church. Or maybe one of them come. They're married. One gets saved. And the other one doesn't. This is the scenario here. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, let's read, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not what? Put her away. So if you have a couple, one gets saved, the other one doesn't, and she don't want to break up the marriage, don't put her away. Stay married. That's acceptable. Let's read on. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not, what? Leave him. Why? Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they what? Now he's not saying that they saved. What he is saying is that God accepts the relationship for what it is. She is not in sin. He is not in sin because there was those who used to teach that if you got saved and your husband's not saved, you got to leave him. That's not what the Bible says. Because they were not in the church. One was not in the church at the time that it happened. And the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife. God is saying because of her being saved, I accept the relationship as it is. And the children are holy, or in other words, they are acceptable with God. It doesn't, doesn't mean that they're saved, you know. It's just that means that God accepts the relationship of what it is. Verse number 15. Uh, right? But if the unbelieving does what? Depart. Let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to what? Peace. Now, if they want to leave, then you let them leave. There's nothing you can do about it. But if they want to stay, you let them what? Stay. And, you're, and they're not bound in that situation. Verse number, what he says, but God hath called us to what? Peace. All right? If you can keep the marriage peaceful by them staying, then let it be that way. Now again, this is a scenario where you had a couple that was not saved and one got saved. They were already married. Okay? You follow? Because uh, in verse number 10, he says, unto the married I command. So he's talking to people that are already married. And some of them had unsaved husbands. Some of them had unsaved wives. They came into the church that way. God is saying he accepts the relationship for what it is. Let's read uh, verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt what? Say that way. So if you get saved and you're already married and you get saved and the spouse is not saved, don't put them away. Don't divorce them. Don't leave them. How do you know? You might be able to win them. This is the only instance where a person can, one to, can be one to be saved without the gospel preached to them. This is the only instance that if the spouse is not saved, they can be one without preaching the gospel to them. You know why? Because the gospel is being preached by the other spouse that's walking with God and they're looking at their lives. Their life is a reflection of the gospel. We had one sister in our church that got saved. Husband was not saved. And in the church, other couples' husbands were getting saved. She would get mad every time somebody else's husband got saved because her husband wouldn't get saved. And eventually she backslid. And the husband would come to church. He was a good man. 
worked for Consumer Powers, good man. And he would say, the reason why I would not get saved is because my wife is the biggest hypocrite I've ever seen in the church. She wasn't living it. And Patrick's dead now, ain't he? Are you still alive? He never got saved. Never got saved. Well, uh, let's read on here. Um, verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in where? In all of the churches. So we're going to stop there, uh, and uh, I guess we'll deal with the Antichrist uh, on Friday, and it goes into virgins and, and all the other things there that we do not have time to cover. Now, uh, again, we just scratched the surface. Uh, like I said, it would take at least six Bible class to teach it in its entirety. And if we can't find those sets, we will be teaching on it, and it will be in detail, and you will under, understand everything about it. Now, no marriage cases are the same. They are all unique in and of themselves. Uh, and so the problem we have today is many people don't know what they're doing. They're out doing things they don't know what they're doing. They're not being taught. They're not being told what the law of God is. And God's going to hold somebody accountable for that. And it's just unfortunate because many people are messing their lives up uh, and binding themselves in relationships that they should not be in. So we're going to close tonight. Uh, just keep in mind, I didn't write the Bible. I just told you what's in it. Any questions tonight? Yes. First Corinthians 7 what? 16. Yes. No, this is not talking about a saint and a backslider. Um, it is not talking about that because you can't save the backslider. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 6, if they shall fall away, it's impossible for you to renew them again unto repentance. So if there's not applying to a backslider because nobody can save the backslider. And that's why God said, uh, told Jeremiah three times concerning backsliding Israel, he said, leave the backslider alone. God is going to deal with them. So no, that's not talking about a backslider. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. People that what? Millennials are people that were born uh, in 2000 on up. They call them millennials because they're children of the millennials. I'm a baby boomer. Are you baby boomer? You on the cuff? <laughs> well, baby boomers are anybody that was born uh, when did World War II end? I think it's 1946 on up to 64. I just made the cut. 64. So I'm a baby boomer. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I think it's the, uh, I think the baby boomers is 1980s on up. There's, 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 there's some, some have the 1980s, some have 2000. Because if, if it's going to be millennials, you have to be have been born as a millennial, whatever, you know. So you can look it up. They got Generation X, Generation Y, X, all the other kind of stuff. You know, I, I just think it's kind of interesting. But we'll just say young people today. You know, people are strange regardless of when they were born, aren't they? <laughs> Lord have mercy. My grandma was strange. Yeah, we got some strange folk. All right. Any other questions tonight? Yes, ma'am. Well, we should have made this point at the beginning. The Bible, the laws of the Bible are only for those that are in the church. The laws of the Bible do not apply to people that are outside of the church. The only thing that is relative to the sinner when it comes to the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's the only message that they need to hear. Like I was talking to um, uh, somebody that was saying that the Bible is contradictory because they said Moses was given the commandment, thou shalt not kill. And then they killed all of those people uh, when they went to war. So he said the Bible is contradictory. Well, I said, no, what you have to understand is that the Ten Commandments only apply to the Israelites. They did not apply to the heathen nations round about them. And that God used the heathen nations uh, or used Israel as an instrument of judgment against the heathen nations round about them for their sinful practices. And so that's why God used Moses and Joshua the way that he did. But the Ten Commandments only applied among Israel. Thou shalt not kill thy fellow Israelite. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He's not talking about your neighbor that lives next door to your house. Your neighbor that is in the church. Your brother and sister that's in the church. Now, we're supposed to love everybody. Of course we are. Can we say amen? But when the scripture says love thy neighbor as thyself, he's talking about your fellow brother and sister in the church. So the laws of the Bible apply to those that are in the church. And that's why when a person backslides, they are still under the laws of the church. So when a backslider walks out on God and marries somebody that is unsaved, all they've done is compounded their sin because they are still under the laws of the church. And their marriage relationship is still messed up because they married somebody outside the church and they backslid. So as long as we, once we come into the church and get saved, we are held under the laws of the church as long as we live. Judgment begins where? At the house of God. And so even if I was to leave the church and go back out into the world, God is still holding me accountable for the laws of the church because I was in the church and I'm still being going to be judged by what the word of God says. Yes, sir. Abusive relationship. Well, the old timers used to teach stay in there and pray and people were getting killed. So um, the Bible says separation. If, uh, if let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried. So if he is abusing her, any woman that gets abused in this church is married, I'm going to tell him you need to leave him because he's not pleased to dwell with you. I love you. No, he loves beating on you. That's what he's saying. You know, uh, so my mother, my father was physically abusive to my mother. Well, my mother got saved. He never laid a hand on her before she got saved. But when she got saved, he put his hands on her. I see my father hit my mother in the face with his fist. And, uh, and she was living a life. Then he eventually came, got baptized, never got the Holy Ghost. She left him and uh, remained unmarried for a space of time. Now, of course, my father had girlfriends all on the side. And she still hung in there with him, but eventually she left. And that's another thing when you talk about uh, you cannot divorce except for fornication. Now, say you have a couple that's married, they're saving the church, and one of them commits adultery. The righteousness of God says that you try to get the relation, marriage relationship to work. That just because they've been unfaithful once, you don't necessarily run out to divorce them because the righteousness of God is this. God told Israel, turn, O backsliding Israel, because I am married to you. And because Israel continued to commit adultery and fornication by serving other gods, if she, if God would put Israel away the first time she messed up, they never would have made it out of uh, uh, to the promised land. Because when they worshiped the golden calf, they committed adultery against God. When Moses was up there getting the law of God from the mountain. But God kept giving Israel chance after chance after chance. And it was only after she refused all of his overtures. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah said he gave her a bill of divorcement and put her away. So, if, so the righteousness of God is of such the model and example that we have on how a marriage uh, is to be dealt with if there's infidelity is how God dealt with Israel. So if the person makes a mistake and you find out 
you know, we don't encourage you to just run out and divorce them, especially if they're repented and they want to make it work. Uh, the Bible says we should follow after the things that make for peace. So if you can get the marriage to work, get it to work. But if the person continues, then you divorce them and put them away. You will be free to marry whosoever you will, only in the Lord. They are bound as long as you live to the marriage vows that they took before God. They will bow. If they go out and marry somebody else, God says they're an adulterer. The guilty party can go out and marry whoever they want to, only in the Lord. But that guilty party, God has bound them to that marriage that they cut asunder. And they will not be free until the other spouse dies. That's how it works. Many pastors don't agree with that, but that's the Bible. I can't help what they don't agree with. That's what the Bible says. That's what God said. You know, what are, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with God? Is that right? Most folk don't accept it, but it don't matter because God's going to look in the end and say, well, you did thus and thus, and that's going to be too bad. Yes, ma'am. Nineteen eighties to two thousand, eighty one to two thousand. Really, that is interesting. <laughs> she said, "Yeah, I just, I just made the cut. I must have saw that statistic when I said I just made the cut." She's saying that uh, what she saw, Generation uh, X, is sixty five to eighty, and. Millennials 81 to 2000. Now, what you got? I got Generation X is 65 to 84. Generation Y is mixed in between the end of Generation X and part of Millennials. Millennials are 82 to 2000. Yeah, well. The Facebook. When did Facebook come in? 2004? 2006. Sounds like they are confused, aren't they? <laughs> Sounds like they're confused. Uh, but uh, I guess they just don't agree among themselves, whatever. But I, I think I, yeah. Well, regardless, whether we are X, Y, Z, make sure we're S-A-V-E-D. We say amen. All right. All right. All right. So we're going to take an offering tonight and, and be dismissed. That's interesting. All that stuff is interesting, though.